Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to week two of the FTMA Mid-Rise Tech Series webinars. My name is Dean Ashton, and I'm the host this afternoon. Uh, I'm with Wood Solutions with the Mid-Rise Advisory Program. Um, I'll be one of the uh, presenters today, as well as Nick Cooey from Prida. But before we get into, um, into today's presentations, uh, we'll just have a, a bit of an overview of the, uh, the webinars in general. Uh, this is week two, as I mentioned. Last week, uh, the, the first week, uh, Alistair Woodard gave us a, an overview of the, uh, the Frame and Trust Mid-Rise Implementation Group. And then Lawrence Ritchie uh, took us for a tour of the, uh, the Mid-Rise Demonstration Model Building at Holmes Glen TAFE. Uh, today, uh, as we said, is, is week two. And then next week, we're going to hear from some fabricators and a, a builder on their perspective of Mid-Rise Timber Construction. Uh, that doesn't stop here. Um, FTMA have got other webinars as well. Uh, Kirsten and Nikita have done a fantastic job putting together a series of webinars. So please go to the FTMA website and you can find out further details. Uh, the FTMA would also like to acknowledge the, uh, the ongoing support and contributions from their sponsors. And you can see all of the, uh, the, the sponsors on the screen there now. Uh, at Wood Solutions, we're also uh, happy to support the FTMA. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Wood Solutions, we're uh, an industry initiative through the Forest and Wood Products Australia, and we provide resources for building professionals to be able to utilise more timber in construction. Uh, I'm part of the, uh, the Mid-Rise Advisory Program, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that uh, very soon. But we also have industry partners uh, that we'd like to acknowledge. And you'll see that some of the, uh, the partners are also the same uh, sponsors of the FTMA. So great to see them getting right behind our industry. For those who may not be familiar with um, Zoom technology, down the bottom of the page, you should see a, a chat button in the ribbon bar. You may just have to move your mouse down to uh, bring up the ribbon bar. Um, you can use this to um, say hello and chat amongst yourselves during the, uh, the presentations. Uh, just go in there and change the settings to all panelists and attendees. If you just leave it on all panellists, you'll only be sending uh, messages to uh, Nick and myself. But if you do want to ask us any questions uh, at the end of the two presentations, we will come back and answer your questions. But so please go in and, and type in your questions here. Feel free to type in at any stage through, uh, through either of the presentations. So moving on to today's um, presentation. Uh, as I said, I'll give you an overview of timber mid-rise systems and then uh, Nick will give a, a more of an in-depth presentation on the frame and trust side of that. Um, for those who uh, know me and have worked with me in the past, uh, it's uh, great to catch up and it'd be better to do this face-to-face, -face, but uh, we can do it online. For those who are not familiar with me, um, I do come from the, the trust and frame uh, industry. Uh, I spent 30 years uh, with MyTech. Uh, I'm an engineer and I, I started in the uh, design office uh, I was also involved in Fabricat support as well as training and development. Uh, I then spent two years with uh, Simpson Strongtie as their national field engineer. And for a bit over the last 12 months, I've been with Wood Solutions with the Mid-Rise Advisory Program. So following my presentation, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, Nick Cooley. And Nick uh, is with Prida and he's been employed by Prida for the past 12 years within the Engineering Design Services Department, specialising in engineered timber truss and frame systems uh, and for the past five years, focusing on leading the Victorian design office team. Uh, prior to joining Prida, Nick was previously employed as a truss and frame detailer for eight years, uh, specialising in roof, wall and floor truss detailing for residential and commercial structures. Uh, Nick was also part of a specialised team set up with Prida to implement floor cassette systems, and we're going to hear more about that today, in, conduct, in conjunction with industry groups, fabricators and builders leading to software solution and support to help promote panelisation into the building industry. So I will now just flick over to my presentation if I can. Right, okay. So uh, just as an overview of the lightweight mid-rise um, systems, basically I'll just uh, touch on briefly on the uh, mid-rise advisory program. Uh, we'll have a look at uh, some of the structural systems that can be used for uh, timber mid-rise. We'll touch on fire resistance, acoustics, and I'll go very briefly into the panelisation because I'm sure Nick will be covering this in a little bit more detail. So as I mentioned, the uh, Wood Solutions Mid-Rise Advisory Program, uh, we're through the Forest and Wood Products Australia. We're an independent non-commercial entity. 
Um, the Wood Solutions website is the number one website in the world for people clicking on for information about timber. Uh, on that website, you'll find over 50 technical design guides that you can download free of charge. Uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of other information. There's podcasts, there's recordings of previous webinars, case studies, and really good information. So please uh, have a good look through the website. Uh, and I've already mentioned that I'm part of the Midrise Advisory Partnership uh, with our sponsors down at the bottom. Uh, last week, Lawrence took us for a, a walk through the, uh, the demo building at Homesland TAFE. It's a, a three-storey full-scale model that's based on a, uh, an, an eight-storey or seven storeys of concrete over, um, over one, uh, one, seven storeys of timber over one storey of concrete. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, during my presentation as well. So why Midrise? And LSD touched on this uh, last week. Um, but basically, uh, in 2016, the, uh, the National Code uh, Construction Code, the NCC, or some people would still refer to it as the BCA, uh, introduced deemed to satisfy provisions for fire protected timber up to an effective height of 25 metres. So when the, uh, the NCC first introduced uh, these uh, deemed to satisfy provisions, uh, it was only for classes two, three and five. Uh, last year in the NCC 2019, it was opened up to all classes of buildings. However, as uh, Alistair mentioned last week, for the, frame, the, the truss and frame sector, uh, we see probably the, uh, the biggest area is the, the class two apartments. Alistair touched on this a little bit last week as well, some of the uh, advantages of um, timber over other building materials. Uh, and we all hear about the, uh, the signature buildings that are going up. Uh, this particular building is 25 King Street in Brisbane. It's the, uh, the tallest timber office building in Australia. And I'm lucky to have an office uh, in this, this particular building. Um, you may be able to see over my shoulder a, a 480 millimetre square glue land column. Well, that is that particular uh, column right there. I'm down one level, but that's the, uh, the column above. But it's great to see all of these uh, signature buildings and it really uh, makes it attractive to go out and talk to uh, architects and engineers. But where we see the, the real volume for uh, timber is in what Alistair was referring last week as the mid, mid, mid. So mid suburbia, mid tier builders and mid rise construction. And um, a couple of the, the things that you can see on the screen there on the, uh, on the, the left hand side, uh, improved safety and faster delivery. Particularly in this current climate uh, with, with COVID, uh, builders have restricted the amount of number of workers that they can have on the, uh, the building site. So prefabrication is perfect for this. The more that can be done off-site and then delivered to uh, not only improve the safety on-site, in, um, increase the, uh, the speed of construction, but also allows it to happen with fewer people on-site as well. And then when COVID does eventually uh, go away, um, there's going to be stimulus packages needed uh, and people are wanting to, to uh, build their, their buildings as quickly as possible. The faster delivery, you know, again, that really is perfect for the uh, prefabrication sector. One of the things that really excited me uh, about the, uh, the mid-rise market um, when I first joined uh, can be shown in um, technical design guide number 27. As I said, these are guides that you can download free of charge. Uh, and this goes through a, a seven storey apartment building that's sitting over a one storey concrete um, retail at the ground floor. And in this technical design guide, it basically goes through a uh, design and cost comparison for a, a lightweight timber option a CLT option and comparing that to a concrete building. Uh, the costings were done by MBN, so it was done by a third party. Uh, and you can see the full breakdown of all of the costs at the, uh, the back of the guide. Um, figures were based on 2017 costs uh, and it's specific for this particular project. Uh, not every project is uh, going to be as attractive, but when we have a look at the actual costs that they came up with, um, CLT came in about 6% uh, less than concrete, which is great for timber. But the real good thing here is that the lightweight timber framing came in a further 7.5% better again. So this is where the opportunity for the, the trust and frame sector really comes in. And like Alistair said last week, um, your, your competition is not the trust plant down the road, it's the, the steel and the concrete guys. So huge opportunities. So when we get into the, uh, the structural systems, the good news is that timber has been used extensively for uh, lightweight framing for housing for, for many years, so single storey and two storey. Uh, we saw that grow into the sort of three storey sort of market. 
Um, and then if we're getting into the townhouses where you, you may have a, an interface between the occupancy ver vertically uh, between the two. And all we're doing is just taking that one more step and basically going a little bit taller. And not only do you have the, the vertical interfaces, now you've also got horizontal interfaces and you may also have mixed applications. You may have retail at the ground floor or offices or something like that. And then the residential area above. So all we're really doing is taking uh, our usual residential type construction and making it bigger. Now these photos were taken in America. And as Alistair mentioned last week, uh, in America, uh, for what they refer to as multifamily type construction, um, it's very common to see four, five, six storey buildings being built out of timber. And a lot of that is stick frame. So imagine the advantages that the uh, prefabrication can offer. And when we're out talking with um, architects and, and engineers, what we're often talking about is trying to optimise the design. So let them know that the upper floor or upper couple of floors of a six or seven storey building could be just the same as your residential type construction. As we go down through the, uh, through the building as the loads increase, um, you might just have uh, studs at closer spacings. You might go into um, double ply, triple ply, or you might go into larger section sizes. Uh, one thing that we do have to be careful of in the, uh, the mid-rise market is the bracing of the structures. And it's, it's not just a matter of the, uh, the, the project engineer putting on his drawings, bracing by others or bracing in accordance with 1684. Uh, he has to go to the extent of, of designing the bracing system. So he may use the, the core where the, uh, the lift and the stairs are. Uh, that could be a timber core, it could be a concrete core. Uh, he may use bracing walls and he may use uh, moment frames. So the, the building I'm sitting in, there's K frames that are used on this building. And it could be a combination of all three. The structural engineer also will probably need to look at the, uh, the floor diaphragms to transfer the, uh, the lateral loads through the, uh, through the floors into those bracing systems. So the connection details um, will be a little bit more substantial than what you're used to in residential type construction. Uh, another area that does need to uh, be looked at um, because we're going taller, because we're getting more loads, is vertical displacement. So um, larger compression forces in our studs, you could get a little bit of axial shortening in the actual studs themselves. Uh, probably more critical, you could get crushing of the timber in your top and bottom plates. Um, there can also be a little bit of um, change in, uh, um, in dimensions through uh, changes in moisture content. A lot of these buildings are air conditioned, so the timber could dry out a little bit uh, more than when it was first installed. Uh, so all of these things need to be considered. And if you are using a combination of building materials, steel, concrete, and uh, timber, uh, you need to take uh, any differential um, displacements into uh, consideration. And there are systems that uh, are available to uh, allow uh, for vertical movement to occur, such as the, uh, the rod systems with take-up devices. Uh, these were used on a, uh, in a project in Sydney. Another area that does need to be considered with uh, any, any timber structures is the durability. And right here in Brisbane, we, we've got some very good examples. You know, we've got uh, Perry House that was built over 100 years ago. This is a brick veneer, uh, timber framed structure. Uh, and then we've got the, uh, the 25 King project that I'm, I'm sitting in right now. You go to Europe, you go to Japan, and you can see timber structures that have survived hundreds of years. So with correct design, correct detailing, and correct manufacture and installation, uh, these buildings can last the time. Okay, now moving on to the fire resistance. Uh, as I, I mentioned before, um, basically we now have um, vertical interfaces and horizontal interfaces between our occupancies, and these need to be considered for fire resistance. So we already touched on the uh, that the, the NCC has um, been to satisfy um, requirements or provisions for uh, fire protected timber up to an effective height of 25 metres. Now that effective height is to the floor level of the uppermost floor. So if we're talking a three metre, three metre uh, floor to floor height, we're talking around about the eight sort of stories. Um, the, the NCC does allow us to go other, other routes. We can go down the performance solution or the deemed to satisfy, but the deemed to satisfy is basically a tick box and it's a lot easier construction, more suited to the, the, the truss and frame sector. So Alistair touched on this last week, but the, the four requirements of fire protected timber, first off, the timber is going to be fully encapsulated 
with a fire protective covering. And usually that's a, a fire grade plasterboard. So you walk into a fire protective timber and you're not going to see any exposed timber. It's all fully in behind the plasterboard. Uh, as Alistair mentioned last week, sprinklers are also required. Uh, that's the first line of defence for fire and uh, any building over four storeys, whether it's concrete, whether it's timber, now require sprinklers to be used anyway. Uh, cavity barriers are, are required so that uh, if the, the fire does breach through the, uh, the protection, it's not going to go up uh, through the building and then go into other apartments. And any, com uh, any insulation needs to be non-combustible. So in the NCC, um, they have, as well as building uh, classes, they also have building types when it comes to the, uh, the fire rating. So for our, our residential type structures, we're probably used to uh, uh, class uh, type C, but anything over four storeys now you can see, regardless of the class of the building, they all fall into that type A type construction. So what does that mean? Well, you can go to the NCC and look up the, uh, the relevant tables. I've taken this information here out of um, one of our uh, design guides, uh, but you can see there it gives you a, an FRL, a fire resistance level. And depending on the type of wall being used, depending on whether it's load bearing or non-load bearing. Uh, the FRL there, 90, 90, 90, that's a, a rating in minutes. So basically it has to have 90 minutes of structural adequacy, meaning that the building is going to stand up for at least 90 minutes. Uh, it's got to have 90 minutes of integrity, so the fire is not going to break through that wall system, and 90 minutes of insulation. So if a fire was to break out in occupancy number one down here, for example, um, the, the, the temperature on the opposite side of that wall in occupancy six uh, needs to be less than a certain temperature in accordance with uh, AS 1530.4. And the good news is there's many ways that timber structures can meet these FRL requirements. One example, if we're using a cavity type wall with a double 13 millimeter fire rated um, plasterboard on each side, 75 mm glass wall in the cavity, that's gonna reach the, uh, achieve the 90, 90, 90 uh, FRL that is required. And I did mention that uh, cavity barriers will be required to stop any, any fire spreading horizontally and vertically up through the, uh, through the structure. Uh, services, um, often services will need to uh, penetrate through the wall or through the floor systems. So there are many um, systems that are, are, are available. These have been tested to meet the, uh, the required um, fire resistance. So you can go into the, the various manufacturers. Uh, we can again have a look in our technical design guides for uh, information as well. Okay, so moving on to acoustics. Uh, when it comes to acoustics, the two main things that we're uh, worried about is airborne sound, so any traffic noise from outside or the neighbours when they've got the, uh, the TV blaring, um, that, that's the airborne sound. And you also have the impact sound of um, somebody walking around on the floor above or, or the kids playing basketball indoors. So in the NCC, um, it, it calls up for the airborne sound a, a, a weighted sound reduction index, the RW. And for some wall types, it'll also include a, uh, a correction factor for um, low frequency sound. So when the neighbours have their, the bass on their stereo really cranked up, we know those low frequency sounds coming through as well. Uh, when it comes to the impact sounds, the, the NCC refers to a, a, an LNW, the weighted normalised impact sound pressure. And just to confuse things for us, uh, when it comes to airborne sound, the, the larger the value, the better the performance. And with impact sounds, the smaller the number, the better the performance. So when we actually have a look in the, or uh, well, before we get into that, uh, the, another thing we need to consider with um, timber structures is flanking or the, the sound transfer through the structure itself. So um, quite often you'll need um, noise isolating mounts or, or resilient connections to reduce any, uh, any flanking through, through the actual structure. So in the NCC, again, I've taken these values here from design guide number 37, but you can see there for the airborne sound, um, there's a, a wall rating there, RW plus CTR needs to be greater than 50. Remember, with the airborne, the larger the number, the better the performance. Um, and that, that wall system that we had a look at before, the, uh, the, the two layers of 13 mil plasterboard with a, a 75 mil glass wall in the cavity uh, will achieve that value. Uh, this will also depend on the size of the stud wall being used. Uh, I think the values I've used here are based on a 70 mil wall frame, a 90 mil would even be better again. 
Uh, when it comes to the floor system, not only do we need to worry about the airborne sound, but also the impact sound. So again, you can see there we have an airborne sound of greater than 50, an impact sound of less, less than 62. And in this example, again, there's many ways of achieving that. This example, if we had 19 mil particle wood floor with a carpet and underlay on top of that, uh, two layers of 16 mil suspended ceiling and a 90 mil glass wall in the, uh, in the ceiling system, it's going to achieve those values. Uh, I will point out uh, these figures here are basically for class two and three buildings. The NCC only uh, calls up requirements for acoustics for class two, three and nine C. Uh, another thing to be careful of with the NCC is it's a bare minimum, basically. So I've, I've taken this table here from Marshall Day Acoustics and we can see there that the RW plus CTR, that's basically for people next door in the neighbouring apartment, just normal speech, you're not going to hear that. But if they've got the TV cranked up loud or they're having an argument, you may hear some sounds coming through the wall. So there may be requirements. Your, your client may have um, expectations that exceed what's actually in the NCC. So the, uh, the Association of Australian, Australasian uh, Acoustical Consultants uh, do have a, a star rating that they recommend for apartment top systems. Uh, I'll just touch on quickly on the panelisation. Uh, as I said, um, Alistair did touch on this last week and I'm, I'm sure uh, Nick will talk about this a bit more soon. Um, trusses have been used in, in Australia for, for many years and when space permits, um, there have been cases where uh, the, the trusses have been assembled into a module and then lifted on site to uh, speed up the uh, on-site safety. Uh, roof trusses, uh, so roof and floor cassettes have been used extensively throughout Australia for the last few years. Again, this really increases the on-site safety, uh, increases the, uh, the speed of construction, uh, and also it enables the, the truss fabricator to value add. So if you can do the construction in a controlled environment in a uh, factory, uh, you're gonna make it a, a lot better for the, uh, for the construction crew out on site. And what we're starting to see a bit more of now is um, wall systems as well. So either partially enclosed or fully enclosed wall systems, uh, including all you know, the fully enclosed has all of the windows and the uh, insulation and everything. Another thing that we're starting to see a little bit of is um, panelisation with the facade systems. So the, the photo on the, uh, the left hand side there, uh, that's taken from Brock Commons over in, in Canada. That's a, an 18 storey uh, mass timber construction. 18 storeys of timber built with no scaffolding. Uh, and the other photo on the right hand side, um, when, when uh, Lawrence was doing the walk around of the demo building last week, uh, he showed us the, uh, the brick um, clip type system uh, and that's at, in use at the Australian National University in Canberra. So just to conclude, before I hand over to, uh, to Nick, uh, if you'd like to find out more about how you can get involved in uh, mid-rise timber buildings, uh, speak to your nail plate manufacturers. So uh, at, with the mid-rise advisory program, we have representation from each of the nail plate manufacturers uh, on our, our committee. Uh, so with um, my tech, there's um, Tim Rossiter, with multi-nail, uh, you could speak to um, Matt Smith or, um, or Travis. And at Prida, we've got Adam Dawson or Nick's about to follow me in uh, his presentation. So thank you, and I'll now hand over to Nick. You there, Nick? You might have to um, unmute and uh, get ready. Yeah, hi Dean, thanks for that. Just uh, about to share my screen. Yes. How's that all good? Yep, we got you there. Excellent. All right, thank you very much, everyone for um, participating today. And firstly, I'd like to obviously thank Dean for the introduction. And of course, for uh, FTMA for giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, today, I'm trying to sort of capture everything within 20 minutes or so. It might go a little bit over. But uh, as, as Dean said earlier, we do have Q&A at the end. And the majority of the focus of my presentation will be within the three to five story range, which is more applicable to, you know, the, the, the frame and truss industry at, at the present time. So firstly, we'll be going uh, through lightweight floor truss systems. So that goes into cassettes, uh, some manufacturing considerations, uh, lifting systems, et cetera. Um, we'll touch a bit on wall framing systems, 
uh, towards the end, uh, we'll look at some roof systems. There's not a great deal out there, but there, as, as Dean said previously, there have been instances where roof systems have been used. And of course, at the end, Q&A. So starting with uh, lightweight floor truss systems, um, when we look at this typical uh, picture of a floor cassette, um, those who, who are, have been involved with um, floor cassettes and panelization, uh, you know what you're looking at, but obviously for, the, for, for fabricators who are, are new or just getting more exposure into this, at first glance, it looks pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, however, it, there are you know, certain considerations that you need to be aware of compared to the traditional floor trusses that you would send to site loose. Um, what a couple of those examples would be how you break up your cassettes, how you sequence them, because the sequence order may, may be critical as you deliver to site and lift onto the, um, uh, onto the building, uh, the end details, the lifting systems, um, and how you manufacture versus um, what, what you expect in terms of site tolerances. So just to touch on some of the very, very basics, um, the idea obviously is, is to provide a panelized system. The idea obviously is to uh, have a factory controlled environment, building the factory, uh, deliver it onto site and lift it onto crane for the, for the best sort of uh, efficiency in terms of you know, getting the building um, up as quickly as possible. So typically we're looking at uh, open systems or open, uh, when we call it open systems, uh, you would have a, a, a flooring on, on top of the uh, floor trusses or eye joists or solids. Um, and usually the, the ceiling uh, is left open um, in, in most instances. So the various combination of materials could be used. Uh, the pre-installed lifting components, uh, various different systems, which we'll also touch on. Delivery to site and the bonus advantage of having a mid rod site, you generally would uh, have a mobile crane or a fixed crane sometimes. Um, so it makes lifting a lot easier compared to uh, other methods. And, um, you know, in traditional residential, you're sort of looking at a two to four hour average project in store for, for per level, which can easily be achieved on a, on a mid rise building. Now, the, the obvious. Um, Open web systems um, are the typical sort of uh, timber timber webs versus the metal webs. Won't go into too too much in that because you know we're, we're all pretty familiar with that. Likewise, with the advantages, um, you know the efficiency in, in in the precision of what you're actually building, especially in a panelized systems, being able to run duct work, um, you know varying varying end details, and of course uh, set downs. So typical flooring options, <clears throat> up to three to four storeys, you might expect particle board would still, would still be there. As you start getting more into a higher level, you might start looking at plywood just to get a better diagram action. Um, then you might have uh, FC sheet or concrete topping systems depending on acoustics. Uh, other systems could be Hebel or Promat. And uh, you know, it, it could vary depending on you know, various project requirements. Ceiling options, um, general plasterboard or FC sheets uh, is, is pretty typical as you get into more insulation material services, depending on whether they're built into the cassette or they're, they're left for a false ceiling. So that will uh, depend on you know, what, what the architect is looking for in terms of the building. Manufacturing wise, we're typically um, uh, looking at around a 2.7 wide cassette and that's always traditionally limited to either the flooring or it could be limited to transport. Um, of course, wider panels, you, you know, there's other considerations that you need when you're transporting the panels. In terms of the cassette length, it's typically around the eight meter long, uh, limited by, again, the production. But of course, uh, some fabricators can build upwards of 12 meters. And in those cases, you have much better benefits being able to have um, you know less uh, cassette lifts and of course uh, increased efficiency. So production wise it could be as simple as um, you know building them on the floor I mean obviously it's not the quickest way but as you get more into uh, uh, manual methods having a, a precision jig having it set up that way more on 
uh, onto a table with some more uh, with some guides that actually help you know uh, with with straightening the cassettes and and having them plumb. And as you get towards more of an automation, you can you can have these various different options going from um, you know custom made jigs all the way up to you know machinery that actually does all the fabrication as well. Now, of course, in some instances where you have uh, resilient mounts or you have uh, false sealing, it's going to be impossible to actually do a closed cassette. So obviously having, making sure that your client is aware of what you're actually giving them and not expecting that you're going to, you know, giving them the whole floor built and supply to site, which can, you know, cause a lot of trouble. When we look at end types, um, you know, so the, so the most common sort of residential end types that you might be used to, uh, most of them can still apply, but of course there are considerations when you look at how to stabilize the cassette and when, especially when you're lifting the cassette, there's um, considerations when you're looking for crushing, especially as you get higher levels, robustness comes into play. So you might um, have a, a rim beam towards the external perimeter. So there are various options that can be used. Uh, as we look into lifting systems, so uh, straps and slings can can often be used, either strapping the whole cassette, or uh, sometimes you might have to cut a hole, a small hole, to wrap the sling around. Uh, there's hooks and chains. There's load rings. Um, screw systems are also popular as well. You just got to be careful if you, especially if you've got a floor truss, because your penetration into your top cord may not uh, give you the the desired result, especially if you only you know, I've got a 35 or 45 mil width uh, cord. And typically with the cassette, you're lifting in, you know, over four points. Now, don't worry too much about the, uh, all the maths on this slide. This is more um, because Dean talked about acoustics and fire. I'm going to concentrate a bit more on dynamics, um, mainly because when, when we sort of first push into mid-rise, um, we've got to understand that um, occupants are used to concrete buildings and we want to try and make sure that when they come into a timber building they're not going to feel a, a real bouncy floor so dynamic assessment is really you know becomes quite critical and at the moment our codes are, are pretty lax it's pretty relaxed in terms of checking for dynamics so we may have to look at um, more stringent methods look at the euro code for example <clears throat> And um, especially, especially further considerations um, when you have supporting elements. And the last couple of slides, we'll look at that. So if we look at a typical uh, floor truss up around that five and a half meter range, 5.4 meters, um, we, we typically assume they're on rigid supports. Um, you know, we, we, uh, unless we're able to analyze all everything in 3D, uh, have all the load transfers in place. This is this is sort of the default, um, you know, design assumption. So in a, in a normal sort of floor scenario, we we consider the supports rigid. Uh, we consider the strong back, and when we look at a, a design such as this with 45 by 90 cords, um, we have a, a frequency of about 11 hertz. So we obviously trying to achieve a minimum of eight. Anything less than Eight hertz can be problematic in terms of the um, the, the dynamics on the floor. So, uh, you know, when we look at this this particular design, it, you know, we, we can see that yeah, it definitely is fine. However, when we substitute one of the supports for a flexible support, and in this case, I've just chosen an arbitrary beam, 250 pfc, and you can see the the span isn't considerably large. It's only 4.8 4.8 meters and it's supporting the same load width as uh, half the floor truss. However, when we look at the, the difference in the truss um, design in this example, we have 11.2 uh, hertz for the truss. The beam, when we assess the beam by itself, is about 15 and a half. Uh, but when we combine the two together, we see a significant drop down to about nine hertz. Um, however, we are still within that sort of um, uh, range above eight hertz, so you know this design would still be okay. But when we combine uh, a secondary um, flexible support, and again it's exactly the same scenario, um, we can see that that the actual frequency of the truss 
has very, very little impact. It doesn't change very much. Uh, likewise with the beam, but the combined system effects starts to drop below eight. Now, so this is where it becomes, you know, quite critical. So as the, as the beams start spanning a lot further apart, um, they, they obviously have a, a more adverse effect on the floor system. So whenever you see these kind of scenarios, it's always good to, you know, check with the Cassanti engineer uh, to see whether they've considered these options. Uh, a lot of the times they assume that the, the floor trusses will take care of it, and that's not necessarily true, um, or otherwise consult your nail plate engineer. So you might be saying, okay, well, what, what can we do to improve dynamics? So uh, the obvious way is, of in, uh, you know, increase the truss depth. So that's not always possible, of course. Uh, we can look at larger chord sections or higher grades to improve the truss stiffness. Uh, more strong backs, however, as you start getting more and more, there's limited effectiveness when, when multiple rows are used. Um, the the layout of the room upstairs is also, you know, can contribute. So if it's a large open space versus um, if there are, you know, crossing walls. Where possible, obviously a continuous span um, can also help considerably. Um, also improving the beam depth or the beam stiffness uh, will be a major factor because you have to remember that the truss, you can only do so much to the truss by the time you start pushing into very, very, high-grade LVLs, um, there's not much more options after that. Okay, so moving on to wall framing systems. So firstly, um, just going through the very basics again, we're looking at uh, the way prefab is versus site framed. So obviously, uh, prefabricated uh, wall frames, you know, very common, sent to site loose um, and, and gets erected on site. So this is, you, you, you obviously see this up to three to four stories, no problem. Um, and the cladding and finishes are generally completed on site. But of course you have the uh, disadvantage of a much longer installation time and a, a much longer build time. As we look at uh, panelized systems, um, again for residential and moving into multi-res, um, gaining a lot more traction. So um, again, we're looking at open panels where, where we have one side cladded, whether it be a sheathing or whether it be an actual cladding, um, then we could look at the way that the windows and doors could be installed. And of course, the advantage here and the value add that you would be providing to your customer would be able to actually um, increasing you know, the, the efficiency and installation time. So a couple of different options could be as, uh, as straightforward as uh, sheathing, could be OSB or plywood, um, like what they do in Europe and, and the US. Uh, it could be something that's, uh, that's uh, included with a lightweight, could be foam or FC sheets and rendered finish. Uh, something as, you know, hebel panels have been done before or other architectural claddings, uh, James Hardy range, for example. And um, as you saw on, on one of the slides before, <clears throat> with the mid-rise, there are certain uh, brickwork systems that can, uh, can also be used. But of course, there's going to be instances where you're going to have, uh, you know, some framing that might need to be done on site, especially if you're trying to fit within steel or fit within tight, very tight tolerances. Uh, so it, sometimes it's just unavoidable and you might have to do some of it. Uh, as site framed. Now, as far as uh, manufacturing storage and installation of wall panels, uh, one of the largest, uh, uh, one of the main things that need to be considered is the way that it's going to be stored and obviously the way, you know, after it gets manufactured. So typically, unlike floor cassettes where you can lay them one on top of each other, um, wall panels are usually um, stored vertically and uh, transported vertically. Uh, they typically are also um, lifted vertically into place and that could be either a, a, a two-point lifting system or it could be a, a spreader bar with multiple points depending on the cassette, uh, the wall panel, sorry. Uh, similar design considerations as we saw for floor cassettes, um, as we get into framing we, we look at uh, creep, shrinkage, and crushing effects. 
So as you get to the lower levels, you may start looking at more LVL material. Um, and as you go further up, you know, coming back to uh, traditional pine framing, uh, lateral stability and connections uh, obviously play a huge part. And as we go into mid-rise, what we see in terms of the wind loads and especially seismic loads come into play, something we don't normally see when we look at um, two or three storey residential buildings. So tie downs and ductility all come into play. Robustness and disproportionate collapse is another thing, but luckily you won't really have to deal with this because this all should be looked at by the engineer. However, you would have some um, contribution into that because the way that they you know, design their, uh, their building will have to take into account what you can actually manufacture, the kind of end details, for example, on the cassettes and what you can actually build in terms of the wall panels. So as, as we get into more lateral uh, stability systems, you, you could uh, have isolated elements, anything from simple as plywood systems, cross bracing systems. I mean, they can all still be used uh, up to a certain point. They might be more or less towards the upper stories, but as you get to the, the middle and towards the bottom, you start seeing more proprietary systems. Could, it could be a portal, uh, it could be uh, a truss brace such as these. Um, it could also be um, uh, uh, an actual nail plated portal truss system. So uh, various combinations can be used. And again, um, the reason I put this one here is because not all fabricators can build a truss portal. Uh, sometimes they are actually 90 mil thick, or if you build them out of two 45 mils, they have to be uh, you know, very well laminated together. So there are definitely considerations. So it's always good to uh, work with the consulting engineer so they understand what you can actually produce. There's no point specifying a system that you can't produce. Okay, towards the end here, we will just got a couple of different slides on roof truss systems. Um, so as we look at mid-rise, the, the most dominant type of system we see is, is just a low pitch mono truss. I mean, that's, uh, especially even in residential, that's pretty much very, very more, more common these days uh, as we get into, you know, trying to limit the height of the building. So of course, as this happens, we see limited roof heights. Um, so we're trying to fit, you know, um, trusses which are much lower than, than what we would normally expect. Uh, then we have to obviously allow for the box gutters and the actual fall of the box gutter. They all have to come into place to, to fit within that architectural constraint. Uh, and on top of that, large air conditioning units and ductwork. So, you know, um, trying to fit them within a very, very small sort of tight space can also be challenging. So uh, anything from solar panels, whether it's the directly applied to the roof plane or on incline panels, they have much uh, larger wind load components that need to be considered. Uh, when we have cantilevered sections, they can be also very tricky. So just be very careful there. Um, and the last couple ones is uh, ponding effects to, due to uh, rain and hail. So sometimes if there's uh, extremely large downpour, we can have um, a considerable amount of deflection on the truss leading to you know, ponding for, for very large spans, especially if the, um, if the truss height is very shallow. Uh, and the last one is also dynamic effects. And you might think, well, how does dynamic effects apply to roof? And um, if anyone's ever had exposure to this, um, we have come across you know, installers who have complained about walking on flat trusses because they just, you know, bounce all over the place. So they feel it's a bit of a HS and, you know, uh, uh, an issue in terms of safety. Uh, so just be aware, sometimes you might come, in, uh, come across that scenario. But as far as uh, roof modules and cassettes, yes, they can be done. Um, it obviously involves a lot of bracing, making sure that um, the, the panels itself uh, are rigid enough to be lifted in place. And of course, there are proprietary systems, uh, whether it be, you know, SIPs panels or actually, um, you know, panel prefabricated panels that actually form a, a, you know, a normal roof plane. And I suppose uh, the sky's the limit and uh, probably a couple of people might be laughing, but hey, you never know, we could get to this level at some stage. 
And uh, that sort of concludes what I've got for today. Okay, uh, thanks for that, uh, Nick. I'll just um, bring up my screen again. Okay, so we've now got time for uh, a Q and A session. So please go into the uh, the Q and A tab at the uh, the bottom of the page and, and type in your uh, questions. Uh, there's been a couple of comments come through, but no uh, no questions yet. So um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Nick, um, maybe you can comment about the uh, the uptake of the uh, the penalisation. Um, you know, of the of the many fabricators uh, getting involved in that side of it um, from from your experience. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> Uh, we, we did have quite a good uptake in Victoria, um, like, you know, four or five years ago. And, we, you know, to a degree we still have, but it seems to have definitely expanded further into other states, into New South Wales, into um, uh, Queensland, for example. So, uh, but I think the, the, the biggest thing that we're still hearing is the amount of production capacity and the amount of fabricators that are willing to actually, you know, go into that mid-rise space. And that's probably, um, you know, as, as you would know, and Alistair probably would, would know, that's one of the biggest factors that we're trying to push into, you know, you know get our fabricators on board with this up to speed and make sure that, uh, you know, they have the, the, the support that can uh, help them push into this market. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, like I, I touched on just briefly in, in my presentation, you know, things like the, the bracing system, you know, you've got to work closely with the, the structural engineer. Um, you know, when we're talking to architects and engineers, um, whatever the type of system is, um, yeah, we're encouraging them to, uh, to get in touch with the suppliers as, as early as possible. Uh, different manufacturers, uh, different fabricators uh, will have um, limitations or, or ways that they go about doing things. So it's uh, the earlier involvement, the, the, the better. Um, there has been a, a question coming from Christine. What could the structural sawmiller do to help? So uh, that's a, a great question. So um, Nick, you might like to talk about that as well. I think it's probably, for me, that's probably a bit early in the stage. I think we need to make sure that our fabrication channel is up to speed first before we can actually look at um, how, you know, certain sawmills or sort of certain products can actually be supplied. I think that's probably the biggest barrier first. I guess, I guess from the uh, the sawmill's point of view as well, um, and traditionally over the years, um, fabricators have been using a lot of you know, 90 by 35 MGP-10 um, as we're going into the mid-rise. Um, maybe the section sizes are going up. Maybe there'll be more MGP-12, MGP-15 possibly. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, that conversation um, needs to include the, uh, the the sawmillers as well to make sure that the, uh, the, the timber is available, um, uh, readily available. Uh, at, right through from uh, quoting stage right through to production. So any other questions? I noticed Alistair has joined us online as well. So um, Alistair, do you have any uh, comments or questions you'd like to, uh, to add? Not really, no, it was a great presentation guys. I appreciate both of them. It's uh, covered the topic really well. Now, Bob, be, it's a pity we can't sort of hook into the actual other people. I'm keen, as you asked, Dean, to know if there's other frame and truss fabricators on the line today who are interested in this and want to know more. Uh, as you mentioned, that's probably a little bit of a bottleneck for us at the moment. We, we do need more frame and truss manufacturers that are interested in sort of trialling some of these projects. Yep. Yeah, it is a bit of the chicken and the egg. Um, as I, I mentioned at the start of my presentation, you know, a lot of people are interested in the signature buildings and we're out talking to architects and they, they initially want to start talking to us about CLT. But then we say it's not just CLT, it's all timber systems that can be used in these buildings. But um, the supply has to be there as well. So yeah, we, we need to be able to, uh, to provide those options um, from supply right through. I think as we sort of mentioned last week as well, you know, the right process that the frame and truss sort of fabricators themselves have said that they want to do is to find their builders that are already doing sort of two or three stories of timber. So they're quite familiar with using timber and, and they trust those builders, you know, that uh, they know those builders aren't going to sort of screw them over. They, they're happy to work on these new projects together in partnership. Because I think everyone knows the first time you uh, 
you do one of these, you know, everyone learns from that. Um, and the second time you do it, it's a lot easier. And the third time you do it, it's easier again. But you do need to sort of build into it slowly. So you know, I think that would be the message for frame and truss fabricators. Look to people you build as you work with at the moment and sort of see if there are ones that are keen to move into this area. Because it does definitely offer more opportunity. I mean, the potential for higher margins and higher returns is, uh, is definitely there. Having said that, they're bigger projects, so you know it's a higher level of risk as well. But uh, yeah, that that that's uh, that's definitely not unmanageable. It's just picking the right projects. Yeah. There's always the option for collaboration as well. So uh, some fabricators could get together. You know, one person do the wall frames, one person do the floor trusses. So there's those sort of options uh, as well. And can I can I just add something um, from uh, and and again, Alistair, feel free to jump in uh, with with your um, program where you where you deal a lot with architects and engineers um, do you see a lot of this sort of three to five story buildings in that early de uh, development stage where fabricators could potentially be brought on board earlier we do, we do um, basically uh, with the, the mid-rise adv advisory program we're out talking with architects engineers we're looking at um, planning applications because we, we find we need to get into a project uh, very early to be able to persuade them to go towards timber uh, a lot of the times that the, the project has already been designed in concrete so um, and um, trying to convert a concrete building to timber is not ideal. So often we're, we're, when we're talking to these people, it could be their next project that um, if we can get in early enough to have a, a timber first paradigm in the, in the way they go about designing it, um, don't go for the, the two-way spans of the floor systems, um, keep the spans down, align walls, don't have transfers. There's, there's a number of ways um, that uh, a timber building um, can be designed better uh, right from the word go. Interesting is that there's a number of um, builders active in this class two area at the moment. So these apartments, I won't name any, just I don't want to sort of call them out, but, but there's a number of quite significant builders building these lightweight timber buildings at the moment. And they will tell you themselves, they can't believe there aren't more people in it. I mean, that, that they know the, uh, the benefits of doing it and the cost savings they can make. That's why they continue to do it. It's more about, as uh, Dean mentioned, it's a chicken and egg about getting that sort of message out. So uh, yeah, th th there's absolutely no doubt. It's, it's not like it's a non-proven system. People have been building them for, you know, 10 or 15 years overseas and at least sort of almost five to 10 years here in Australia. Hmm. There has been another question that's come in from uh, Mark. He, he's saying uh, builders are, are nervous about new systems due to Opal Towers, etc. cetera. Uh, what can you do to ease this concern? Well, again, this is ideal for prefabrication. You're not relying on the guys on site. Uh, you've got quality control systems in the factory. Uh, so you've got uh, a better system uh, and being installed quicker with fewer workers on site. So there are definitely advantages of, of timber systems. Um, so again, when we're talking to, uh, to architects and engineers and the builders, developers, and we're talking about the, all of the benefits and that's just one of the, one of the advantages. Mm. I think also an answer to that question, particularly about Opal Towers, it's an important to uh, recognise that, uh, you, as we all know, that uh, in some of this commercial type uh, construction, that the quality of buildings pretty poor. There's been a lot of dodgy people out there building for a lot of years, which is finally catching up with them. And, and that, that's a really important uh, message as we take this forward is that uh, we're talking systems here. You know, I mean, the timber is just one actual component of a system. You've got to do the fire rated plasterboard right. You've got to do the acoustics right. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. So it's really important when you do actually enter into these uh, buildings, you do it with, do with a builder with that you understand has good quality and you know has good quality. So you know, I think the Opal Tower, like quite a few other buildings, like we've seen with this sort of external cladding issue where builders for trying to save a bit of money have used non-compliant systems. Yeah, they're definitely not the people you want to be working with. In fact, probably the biggest risk for us is if we see sort of dodgy builders coming in and wanting to do this stuff because they can then actually sort of, you know, wreck the whole system for the rest of us. I was reading too that they're, they're trying to introduce a, a system in some states of registering developers as well, because there, there have been issues where developers are just going for the, the cheapest cost possible. Um, and uh, yeah, a couple of years down the track, they've changed names and moved on and yeah, who's responsible. Hmm. And I think it's, it's Kirsten from FTMA here. Um, I think it's also important to note that um, if we go back to when we did the floor cassettes program back in 2013-14, it's, it's now got to the stage that builders, you know, are expecting that that could be delivered by fabricators. So it's taken a bit. 
But um, the beauty of these sort of webinars is that people can share the information with their builders. And, and exactly like Alistair and Dean pointed out, that if there's fabricators out there that are doing two stories, then you know let's let's move people to the three stories and take those builders along because it's the builders that are doing the three stories that are the ones that are going to feel more comfortable doing four stories in partnership with you as a fabricator. So share this information as we go, and um, all the all the recordings will continue to send you and put on the website. So um, please continue to share them um, because that's the only way we're going to get the builders across the road we across the line with the fabricator. Okay, well, we've still got a few more minutes. So uh, any, any last minute um, questions that uh, may be coming in, uh, we, we've still got time to answer those. But um, while we're waiting, I'll just uh, remind people that um, next week uh, we're um, gonna be here at the same time. Um, so two o'clock uh, next Wednesday, and we, we're gonna have uh, some fabricators and a builder talking about um, their perspective on, uh, on mid-rise type construction as well. So any... Last calls for any questions before we uh, wind up? I think you must have answered them all. <laughs> done a, um, you know, on behalf of everyone that's joined in, um, a huge thanks to Nick and Dean. Um, it's, it's a fantastic presentation. We will send out. I think we've got one more question that's just come in there, Dean. Ah, yes, yep. <laughs> Adam just asked, are there any changes in the availability of land, flat blocks, etc., that are leading builders to consider the alternative systems uh, example ground floor cassettes and yeah that is a very good uh, very good question um, we're definitely seeing uh, the uh, like in Alistair's presentation last week he was talking about the uh, the mid 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 suburbia so people uh, are not wanting to live in the uh, high-rise apartments they're trying to uh, move away from that sort of environment they're wanting to be um, close to public transport so train and um, road and rail um, and so the, that mid-rise is certainly, uh, certainly a, an opportunity for that. Uh, but there is also uh, other areas where for the residential type construction, um, maybe people are starting to build on lots of land that aren't flat and not ideal to the concrete slab. They're uh, starting to get on uh, slopes and things like that, where a floor cassette is, is ideal for those sort of situations. So going back to the, uh, in Brisbane, you know, the old Queenslander style construction, that's perfect for, um, for floor cassettes. I might just add to that one, Dean, also that, um, look, in terms of mid-rises, um, as Dean mentioned earlier on, typically what you find if it's, a, um, if it's an apartment type building, as Dean mentioned, you'll find the ground floor is generally mixed class. So they'll often have in that, uh, you know, shops and things like that, just to get sort of better return on the building. Um, and because that's, um, that usually generally requires a sort of higher fire rating, and if the buildings do have a basement, as Dean mentioned, that's generally done in concrete. So often we find that the basement on the first floor is, a, is concrete, giving a concrete podium, and then it's timber above it, which is a good thing in a sense, because that helps us with the durability and the termite issues. Um, but coming back to Adam's question just on that, so in mid-rise, I'm not sure that we'll see a lot of, to be honest with you, cassettes used in ground floor, because I think often we'll see ground floor as concrete, but we may not. If it's a three-story, definitely that's, you know, you, you, you may see it. But I can certainly say from the work I've done recently with FWPA with the volume builders in the residential section, there's lots of the volume builders at the moment who are definitely interested in ground floor cassette systems on sloping sites and flood inundation zones. If we can show that it's cost efficient, which we know we can, and we're just updating our cost studies on that at the moment. And importantly, if the frame and trust sector is happy to provide that design, fabricate and install, which isn't a big deal. And we'll be sort of talking about that further with the sector shortly, but i tell you definitely in that class one section, there's a lot of volume builders nationally interested in ground floor cassettes at the moment. Okay, well, our hour is just about up. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, um, for logging in today. Uh, and we'll see you all again this time next week. Fantastic. And I'll send everybody a link in the reminder next week. But you can use the same link that we, because we've kept it the same for the three events. So you can log in using the same link, but I will send you the recording and we'll put it up on the website. So thank you everyone. And now is the time for prefab, especially in Metro Melbourne when you can only have five builders on site. <laughs> good, good, good chance. Okay. Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.